Hi there, thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about Play Studios Inc, ticker symbol MYPS. We're going to analyze the business and then do a valuation of it to see if the Play Studios stock or share is actually worth it as an investment. So to start, let's talk about how Play Studios has actually underperformed. They went public as a SPAC in 2020 or 2021. And since then, they have severely underperformed the market. The dust has settled, and most SPAC stocks are severely below the prices at which they went public, uh, most of the time rightfully so. And Play Studios is no exception. Nowadays, as of March 2023, they hover in the $3 range, the upper $3 range. Let's call it between $3.50 and $4. And this is a severe underperformance relative to the market, and also would be a significant loss if you bought it when it went public. So what does Play Studios actually do? They have a game library of mobile games. They mainly have casino games related to slots, and now they also have an exclusive license for Tetris in every single country except China, as well as some puzzle and brain games and a few action games as well that has entered their portfolio through a new acquisition that they recently made. So they have basically some market share in the brain and puzzle games, the arcade and action games, and casino games. And it is more so in the casino and brain and puzzle games, but basically gaming is a growing market and they're trying to diversify within this gaming market. And recently they acquired Brainium, which brought in a repertoire of these puzzle games. Brainium has a revenue of $22 million for 2022, and this is actually a fairly small share of uh, Play Studios total revenue, which is around $290 million for the fiscal year 2022. So it is less than 10%, but also could provide them some diversification with their game portfolio. And if they are able to further monetize these games and optimize all these games, then there may be even further gains or the potential for even further games down the line. What they're really trying to do nowadays is to improve player retention. And they have created a program called Play Awards, which essentially gives you all these awards for staying loyal, for playing these games for a while, and, re and you can redeem all these rewards. So it's an incentive for you as a player of their games to stay there for longer and keep playing so you can get all these different rewards. And they're saying that it is essentially um, driving up the minutes that someone stays playing each of their games. And hopefully that will also result with driving up the in-app purchases, the amount of time people spend watching ads and stuff like that. So hopefully it helps the whole product life cycle. Here's essentially what it would do from the launch to the contraction of each individual game, you would still have people more engaged. And this is key because the trick is when you're releasing stuff like gaming or releasing any product that is selling towards people's leisure time, you're competing with a lot of things. You're competing with Netflix. You're competing with every other game in the app store. So retaining someone is key and is incredibly tricky. So let's talk a little bit about their financial results. Now, in this last fiscal year, 2022, they actually experienced a net loss. And this has happened for the first time in what I assume is a while, definitely the first time since they went public. Before, they used to have a positive net income. However, you'll notice that there are ever contracting margins from their income or loss from operations. This contracting operating margin can be a subject of concern. You will see that in 2020, they actually had positive operating earnings, while that became a loss in 2021, and that became an even wider loss in 2022. Now, you could say that it became a wider loss in 2022 because of maybe stuff related to the Brainium acquisition, or maybe there is simply not a priority there where maybe they're hopefully scaling up and advertising their games more, especially because you'll see a significant jump in selling and marketing from $57 million to $79 million and $80 million from 2020 to 2021 and 22. So maybe their focus has shifted a little bit into that growth mode, right? And the thing is, they have to bring this back eventually. 
you cannot run a company that has a net loss and a operating loss forever. So if they can bring back those margins, theoretically, they will do a lot better. However, recently, they have not been proving that. And even though they have had positive net income in previous years, actually, this is the first time in since they've been public and actually in more than five years where they have reported a net loss. So this is a one-time thing, hopefully, but if they cannot keep delivering net profits, then there must be serious consideration as to what we're doing if we're investing in this stock in the first place. They actually do have a lot of cash, however. They, for all intents and purposes, don't really have any debt, which in a rising interest rate environment for a tech company is actually a really good position to be in, to have no debt. And they do have just a lot of cash. They say they have $290 million or more of available liquidity, and that could be used to repurchase shares, to acquire other companies or more awards for their engagement program, or simply grow their current businesses. Will they do any of that? We will see. That is simply tentative plans. And free cash flow is another story. Even though they have negative net income, they have always had positive free cash flow. So here, I did this calculation really, really quickly, and I am excluding any net borrowings because essentially they have none. So I essentially just grabbed their cash flow from operations and subtracted their capital expenditures to get their free cash flow to equity. And they have had positive free cash flow to equity and fairly consistent one at that until this latest fiscal year in 2022, where it dipped a little bit. And most of their free cash flow to equity has represented in the vicinity of 11 to 13 percent of their revenues. So that is the percent of revenues that is getting turned to free cash flow to equity. And I can use this free cash flow to equity and these revenue growth predictions to create a discounted cash flow model. So that's exactly what I did. I am grabbing some pretty negative revenue predictions in terms of the outlook. They said that in their guidance, they expect to have somewhere between 300 and 330 million in revenues for 2023. I essentially chose that lower value, the t closer to the 300 million, and then I'm giving them essentially a five-ish percent growth rate for the subsequent three years, 2024 through 2026. Now, I am also assuming here that the percentage of revenue that gets turned to free cash flow is going to improve as the years go by. So this last year, 2022, only 7% of their revenue was turned to free cash flow. I'm assuming this goes back to 11% and it eventually goes back up to 12, 13, and 14% for uh, the year 2026. This is possible. They have actually posted numbers as good as 17 and 15% of revenue being turned to free cash flow. So the only reason I'm doing this is because they have done it before. And plug in these free cash flow numbers in a discounted free cash flow model using a required rate of return of 11%, perpetual growth rate of 2%, and dividing it by the total number of shares, I get a fair value of $3.73. However, if we add the net cash that they have, because they essentially barely have any debt, then we would get a fair value of $4.62 with net cash included. However, there has to be a margin of safety assigned to this. And that is essentially the price that you're willing to pay under the actual price to account for the errors in this calculation. My calculation is not going to be perfect. I think 10% is too low. It's still a very young company with no reliable profits as of yet. And it's going to be hard to tell exactly how much they'll make in profits. Revenue is, is fairly simple, fairly predictable. However, profits is going to be maybe a little more sticky. Even with this new emphasis that management clearly has on expanding their margins and making them better. Revenue and free cash flow, however, seem non-volatile or cyclical. So there is a little bit less variance there. They are part of a gaming market that is ever growing. And so growing may slow down, but it may not actually reduce unless something significant happens, maybe a global recession. So I think a 20% margin of safety is reasonable. So if we get the previous fair value we got of $4.62, and we essentially discount that 20% from it, we essentially get $3.70 as a fair value with a margin of safety. 
So that's the value maybe if, if this calculation makes sense that I would buy it under, right? So I'm going to give three scenarios or three different stories for Play Studios as to what I think could happen for this stock. So the first scenario is that the margins slowly expand. This is the scenario that I am accounting for in this model, right? I have slowly expanding margins and the amount of free cash flow that is that comes from revenue is slowly expanding. Now, in that case, it is pretty close to fair value. That $3.70 that I got after the margin of safety is pretty much where the stock is right now. And any possible price catalyst would be share dilution or buybacks. If they issue more shares, you can see the price go down maybe because all of a sudden your shares are worth less. Or if they start buying back shares, then maybe that will fuel a, a rise in the price. There is a lawsuit that they're currently going through related to their gambling apps. If there's a significant loss from this lawsuit, that could also be a point of concern. That could be a price catalyst downwards. Or if acquisitions significantly change cash flows, if this brand new acquisition, which does not represent a significant amount of cash flows as of yet, but if it happens to represent a huge amount for the next year, then this could change the picture as new information comes in. There's another scenario where margins stay exactly the same as they are right now. And in that case, the stock is severely overvalued. If cash flows and margins do not significantly change from the Brainium acquisition or any future acquisitions, then the company is in a little bit of trouble, if anything, because they do not have the net income or the operating income to sustain their current activities. So they have enough cash to survive for quite a few years, but something has to give at some point. And if the margins stay the same, it is simply is overvalued and there are other opportunities that you could look at, especially since slowly expanding margins give you a value that is decently close to what is currently happening in the present. So if the lack of organic growth keeps the margins low, especially if they're only growing through acquisitions, then there's also a pretty big problem there. And the share dilution continues and doesn't stop at all, then yes, it could be overvalued, especially as new shares are issued. We'll see how much that actually is. The third scenario is a best case scenario where margins quickly expand. In that case, the stock would actually be undervalued and maybe my model isn't doing it justice. Maybe they go, instead of passing first 11, then 12, then 13% of revenue to free cash flow, maybe that jumps immediately to 15%. And if they can maintain that for a long time, then yes, my model is not doing it justice and the stock is undervalued. Now, if organic growth buoys, then total earnings is going to also buoy and that would hopefully give them a lot to work with. That also means they have more money to acquire companies, to market stuff, to do share buybacks. Uh, if they manage to drive down their costs significantly and buy back more shares, that would also increase the value of the underlying share. I will say, however, the margins and cash flows matter. It all depends on how they're going to execute on this plan of increasing their margins and increasing their cash flows by extension. So that is essentially what management is emphasizing, or at least the narrative they are telling us. Whether or not this happens, we don't know. But it'll be very interesting to see whether or not Play Studios will manage to execute on this promise. And another thing is that competition is pretty fierce. When you have a digital company like Play Studios that sells to people's free time, that is very powerful, but you're also competing with Netflix, you're also competing with every other video game, you're also competing with going outside. So even though they have exclusive rights to, for example, Tetris, or they have games like Sudoku that'll always have a market, you still have many alternatives out there. So they don't have a lot of customer loyalty. That's what they're trying to build right now. So at the same time, this is something that maybe increases the risk in your risk reward calculation because it is competing with a lot of things out there. And that is something important to remember. Now, I hope this valuation gave you some insight into Play Studios as a stock. And if you have any questions about this valuation, feel free to comment it down below. Or if you have any requests for future valuations as well, I'm more than happy to listen. And with that said, I thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day.